that we would find joy and rejoicing in things you've written in your Bible. We pray this in Jesus' name, and amen. When, when, I, when I go to a place, get to go to a place I, where I've not been before, I, I, I like to preach this message, and, and if, you've, if you've heard it, I'm, I'm sorry. I hope it'll still be a blessing to your heart. But for all my life growing up, Five years old up till I got saved when I was 19. My family was in and out of church. We weren't there all the time. We weren't there faithfully. But, but I had heard the gospel, I don't know how many, hundreds of times I heard it before I really heard it. You understand? And then since I've been saved, thousands, countless thousands of sermons, pamphlets, books about, about Calvary, about the crucifixion. And I'm, I'm saying this, I'm not saying it critically. I, I'm saying it because it's so. Every sermon I ever heard about Jesus dying on the cross, was Jesus Christ the man, the human, suffering and dying on the cross? We believe that Jesus was, was man, but he was God manifest in the flesh. And I have never heard a, a, another sermon on the God side of Jesus who went to the cross. All of them that I've ever heard have been on the man side of Jesus going to the cross. I want to preach to you tonight about the God side of Jesus at Calvary. Start with me in John chapter number 10. John chapter 10 and verse number 17. John 10, 17. Jesus says, Therefore, doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life. I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power. I have power to lay it down, and I have power. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So you might have heard in, in the religion of your youth that the Jews were Christ killers. That's not true according to the Bible. You might have heard that the Romans killed Jesus and put him to death. Well, there, there's, there's some Bible for that, and, and a certain select company of men who rallied the forces at Jerusalem and, and plotted the thing together. They're called Christ's murderers in the book of Acts. But the fact of the matter is, according to Jesus, no one took his life. No one took his life. He laid down his life, and the Bible says that in that day when Jesus died, Rome was not the power, Jews were not the power, Satan was not the power, death was not the power. Jesus said the great power on the scene that day at Calvary was he himself. I have power. Now, look over in your Bible in the Old Testament to Ecclesiastes. Now, don't lose John. We'll come right back to John in a moment. Ecclesiastes chapter number 8. Your Bible will run Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse number 8. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 8. Watch these words from the Holy Spirit. There is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. There's no discharge in that war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. You know, you know what you just read in your Bible? The Bible's true. The Word of God is true. It's absolutely true. Every word of it's true. It says, no man has power in the day of death. If you and death ever meet face to face, death will be the greater power. You understand? Any son of Adam that ever came face to face with death, death was the superior power. So if one man on one day met death in the street at Jerusalem, and they step off ten paces and draw. This is the first time in the history of the world that death is facing a man that has power, the greater power than death. Then, then, then if that's true, if no man has power in the day of death, if no man is a superior power to death itself, then Jesus Christ is more than a man. Amen. 
He's not a son of Adam. He, he has become man. He's taken upon him the form of a man. He's walking in a body of flesh formed in the womb of Mary. But that one walking in that body of flesh, carrying that cross up Mount Calvary and laying down his life upon that cross, he's doing so not against his will but as an act of his will, and not because he can't get out of it, but because that's what he came to do. He is the superior power. I want to show you tonight seven, seven things very quickly that prove Jesus Christ was in control and that men did not kill Jesus, but that Jesus laid down his life. In your Bible, in John 18, let's go there, John chapter 18. And with it, Matthew 26. This is Bible conference. We can turn a few pages here tonight. John 18 and Matthew chapter 26. Here's point number one. No man killed Jesus. He laid down his life. Let's look at his arrest. John 18 verse 1. When Jesus has spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book Cadron, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples and Judas also which betrayed him knew the place for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then having received a band of men and officers and chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Let's set the stage here. Judas is known to Jesus as his betrayer. Jesus tells him when they're eating in the upper room, he looks at him and says, what thou doest, do quickly. He dismissed Judas and sent him away so that Judas could betray him. Then, knowing Judas had gone to get the soldiers, knowing Judas had gone to get the men that wanted Jesus dead, Jesus didn't slip out of town. Jesus didn't go into hiding. Jesus didn't put on a disguise that you just read. He went to the very place where he knew that Judas knew he would be. Isn't that amazing? This isn't somebody, look, if, if you say, you know, I got four guys that are going to kill you first chance they get, and, and I see you slip out of the room, and I know you're going to get them, guess where I'm not going? Anywhere you think I might be. Because I want to avoid death. We all want to go to heaven, but not today. <laughs> Jesus went to the very place Judas knew where he went to pray after supper. Correct? Now watch this. Look at verse number 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am. You ever, ever heard that name before? I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. You ever think about that? Look at verse 7. Then ask he them again, whom seek ye? <laughs> now watch this. Here come all these soldiers with their weapons and their torches and their swords and their spears and the handcuffs and the ropes and all the rest of it. And Judas is with them. And, and Jesus, he doesn't run. He doesn't hide. He walks out to meet them. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Boom. They all fall backward to the ground. By the word of his power, he laid them all out flat. Now, and the Bible didn't say they got up. The Bible says, Jesus said to them again, who are you looking for? You, you looking for me? How about you? You want some of me? You, hey, big boy, you, 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 you want some of this? And Judas himself is lying there flat on his back, thinking, I have made the worst mistake any man ever made. Do you understand? They could not have arrested Jesus had he not been willing to go. They could never have bound him. They could never have led him to Pilate's judgment hall. They could never have struck him with the first fist or hit him with the first blow. Jesus Christ proved in the Garden of Gethsemane this is all according to his plan, not theirs. And he is in control, not them. Praise the Lord. Look at Matthew 26, or 27, no, 26, Matthew 26 his buddy Peter's going to help him out here. And the Bible says in verse number 
51, Behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. And people always wonder, well, that guy's pretty, pretty lousy with a sword. How do you swing a sword at a guy and hit his ear? Well, you're not swinging this way. The guy's on the ground. Peter, Peter's trying to hack his head off, and the guy rolls, and, and he gets the, the ear in the side of the head. Now well, watch. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray my father, and he shall presently give me more than, more than 12 legions of angels. I'm not good at math. I, don't, I, I, I never liked math in school. You, you young people, you like math. I was doing okay in math until somebody put letters in it. Amen. And they'd say, four plus A equals, it don't equal nothing. <laughs> you, you can't add a number and a letter. That <laughs> just, it just that never computed. Anyway, a legion is 6,000. Twelve legions, I hope I got this right, is 72,000. One time... Isaiah 37, an army surrounded Jerusalem and they were going to wipe out the Jews. And God sent an angel, one, one angel, sent an angel down. That angel killed, this is Isaiah 37, that angel killed 185,000 men before McDonald's opened for breakfast. Now, assuming all angels are as mighty as e each one is as strong as the other, 12 legions of angels could kill 13,320,000,000 men. Or pretty much everybody that ever lived from Adam up to the Second World War. Nobody killed Jesus. He could have called 12 legions of angels. You know why he didn't call them? He didn't need them. He could take out every soldier on the planet by himself. You don't believe that? Look what happens the second time, second time he comes. How many, people you th how many soldiers do you think are in the valley of Megiddo when Christ comes again on that white horse? How many are left standing after he rides through? Zero. I'm telling you, not only did men not kill him, they could never have gotten him to that mock trial had he not been willing to go. All right, let's fast forward. Jesus Christ is on the cross suffering there, dying for our sins. Come to Matthew 27, Matthew chapter 27. The Bible says in verse number 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Now I'm going to tell you the tale as I'm sure it was happening to the Lord's right, as I'm sure it was happening to the Lord's left, I've, I've read the books, a doctor looks at Calvary, and, and I, I, I've read the commentaries and so forth, and, and I, I don't disagree. They tell us that if a man is nailed or tied to a cross, it's a cruel and horrible form of, of, of a long, prolonged, torturous death. What happens is you can only stand for so long in that position. Soon the blood is running from your arms. You don't believe it holds your arms up like this for 20, 30 minutes, and, and you can't do it. They, they say, by, uh, you wake up sometime, my arm went to sleep. Well, you, you know, and it's, so, so there's the arms like that. So you can't hold yourself up. Then your legs begin to cramp and fatigue as they bear the weight of your body, and soon you're, you're literally, you're, you're hanging on a cross, and the weight of your torso is pressing against your lungs and you're trying to draw a breath but it, as soon as you try to breathe the air is being forced out of your lungs by, by, by the weight of your body and so your legs are giving out your arms are giving out you can't breathe but you can't die and it's just, it's just torture and men eventually they, they, they suffocate you know what the Bible said after Jesus Christ had hung on that cross for hours and hours and hours, not only bleeding from his hands, from his face, from his brow, from his back, but having endured the wrath of God against all sinners' sins there upon that cross, the Bible said he cried with a loud voice, It is finished! That's not a man suffocating. 
That's not a man who's lost control. Do you know something? To cry with a loud voice, you have to have lungs, back muscles, shoulder muscles. Uh, the, the entire strength of your body goes into lifting up your voice and crying aloud. I tell you, that guy on this side, he's not yelling. That thief dying over here, he's got no strength. But that man in the middle, he is as strong, listen, he is as strong at the very end of that torturous crucifixion as he was when he carried that cross up that mountain. You know why? He's not just a man. He's God manifest in the flesh. He's the creator of the heaven and the earth. It'll take some more, more than some nails to kill him. Take more than a whip to kill him. Took, you say, well, he's losing all that blood. He created the blood that flows through the veins of mankind. Why? You don't think he could heal himself a million times? Listen, if he wanted to, he'd still be hanging on that cross over there today. And you could take a trip, go over, see a man been hanging on a cross for 2,000 years saying, you can't kill me. You can't kill me. I'm God. But he didn't come to live. He came to die. He didn't come to avoid death. He came to get you out of death's grip. Praise God. Well, look at the next thing. We'll, we'll come back to Matthew in a little bit. Come to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. John 19 verse 28. There are two things here of interest. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Verse number 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now this next point is like unto the one we just made. Every painting I've seen, I, I'm, not, I'm not being critical. I'm not trying to say I'm right, everybody else is wrong. I'm not. I'm but every painting I've ever seen of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, he looks like a man would look if he was hanging on a cross. He is, he is like this. All the crucifixes you saw growing up in, in that, that statue church, he, he's like this. That's what happens when death is overcoming you. As you die a slow, cruel, uh, 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 painful death of crucifixion. But the Bible says that after Jesus cried with a loud voice, he did what? He bowed his head. Do you know what that means? His head is not hanging limp upon his body. You know what that means? The muscles in his neck are still under his control. He has held his head high hour after hour after hour. The lights go out. The father bruises him. The lights come back on. He's still standing. His head is still held high. And when it's time to die, as he determines it, when it's time to die, as he wills it, he bows his head because his neck, his shoulders, his arms, his back, his legs, it's almost as if he's God Almighty. They're not affected by all the physical suffering. I'm not saying there was none. The Bible teaches that. But I'm telling you, that's not a man hanging there. That's Almighty God hanging there. And the fact that he bowed his head shows that he is in control. He has not succumbed. He has not been overcome. He's not overwhelmed. He hasn't fought as long as he can fight, and now he's finished. He decided this Passover lamb is going to die at evening, and the evening has come, and I am going to lay down my life. Praise the Lord. Now look at verse 28. We, we read it, but uh, we, we, I don't want to skip over it. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, watch, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Again, I'm not saying he wasn't thirsty. He was. Psalm 22 said that his, his tongue claved to the roof of his mouth and his, mm, he wanted water, water, water. That's a man. But the Bible says as, as God manifests in the flesh hung there, as John records it, he didn't say, I thirst, so he could have a drink. 
He didn't say, I thirst so he could be comforted. He said, I thirst that the scripture might be fulfilled. That's why he said that. Now, I, 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 your, your pastor, he, he might be the best Bible memory man in the United States of America. I hope he is. He might be. But I know there are many, many verses in the Bible that I memorized when I was young, and I don't know where they went. They're still in the Bible, but they're not up here anymore. And I remember memorizing chapters of the Bible. We, we set out this year at our church, we, we, we count them all up, broke them all up, 52 weeks of the year, two verses a week. And as a church, we're going to memorize the book of Philippians. I was all gung-ho. And we get up the, the first uh, midweek service, and we all quoted the first two verses together. And the next week, we all quoted the first four verses together. I was doing great till about 10 verses in. And when I learned verse 9 and 10, something happened to verse 1 and 2. <laughs> now, let's, let's add something to that. How's your spiritual life when you're sick? How's your spiritual life when you're hurting? How's your spiritual life when you're distressed? You know why we ask people to pray for one another? When, when somebody's sick, you know why we ask you to pray for them? Because they're in no condition to pray for themselves. When somebody's down in the dumps, you know why we ask you to bring them before the Lord? Because they're, no, they're in no condition to have this great spiritual communion and fellowship with the Lord. Jesus Christ has had his back whipped, the Bible says, like a plowed field. They have torn his beard out of his face. They have driven a crown of thorns into his brow. They have repeatedly buffeted him with their fist. They have driven nails into his hands and his feet. And his father has poured out his wrath upon him. And as he hangs there on the cross, Jesus Christ is reviewing 39 books full of prophecies regarding his first coming and his death on the cross and his payment for sin to make certain he has fulfilled everything that was written of him as it was written. I don't know those prophecies on my best day. I certainly can't call them all to mind on my worst day. But if Jesus Christ is searching all the scriptures, did that check, did that check, birth check, wise men check, shepherds check, carpenter check, they, and he's going all the way down through, uh, bruised, rejected, despised, spit upon, pierced, check, 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 check. Ho, oh, ho, I'm supposed to cry, I thirst. That's what you just read. That the scripture might be fulfilled. Cried, I thirst. And when he had fulfilled the last prophecy regarding his first coming, then he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. I'm telling you, the Lord's control of his enemies in the garden, the Lord's control of his physical body as he hung upon the cross, the Lord's control of his breathing and the upholding of his head, and the Lord's control of his thoughts, the clarity of his thought, all tells me death is not winning. Not this day. Not this day. Jesus Christ has called death out and he's going to meet your last great enemy on his terms, not death's terms. And I'm telling you, by the time this thing is over, he walks out of that grave and he says, Behold, I have the keys of death and hell and I am alive forevermore. Amen. He, he, didn't, he didn't come to avoid death. He came to defeat death. And that's exactly what he's doing. Now, keep your, keep your place right there in John. We'll come right back in a second. Look at Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter number 23. Do you recall? Well, I'll, I'll wait till you get there. Luke 23 and verse number 46. Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, we, we read that cry, it is finished. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Ecclesiastes 8, 8 said no man can do that. No man can do that. It works two ways. You can't keep yourself alive if it's time for you to die. 
can't be done. You say, well, yeah, I've just had enough. I'm going to end my life. Have you not read the book of Revelation? There's a day coming when men will seek death and won't be able to find it. They will want to die. They will try to die. It's so bad. It's so awful. I'm just going to kill myself. And they, and they can't. You know why? You're not in control. Death's in control. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, he, look, look, you, you are spirit, and soul, and body. Made in the image of God. God Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God, God said, let us, plural, one God, plural. Let us make man in our plural image. So God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Word, Holy Ghost. These three are one. Made man, spirit, and soul, and body. One day, one day. Might be today. Might be while I'm preaching. I'll breathe my last breath. Before my body hits the ground, I will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Now, there's coming a resurrection because it's still me. I, part of me be there. Part of me be in the ground. One day we'll all be there. Uh, uh, you know, all of me be there. So Jesus, as he hangs upon that cross, they're going to take his body down and lay it in a tomb. His soul is going to descend into the lower parts of the earth. He's going to have a little fellowship with a, with a dying thief in paradise. And then three days, three nights later, come back out. That soul is going to go back in that body. Uh, but, but what does he do? On that cross, he said, Father, into thy hands, I, 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 not death, I, not old age, I, not a car accident, I commend my spirit. And he, he gave up the ghost. You remember Stephen in Acts 7, he's preaching? And the leaders of that Jewish nation, they get so angry with him, they take up stones and they stone him and they stone him and they stone him. And, they stone him and, and as, the, as, you, as you're about to die, he says, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The best you can do is ask God to take your spirit when it leaves your body. That's the best you can do. But this man, he's not like you. This man, he's not like anybody else who ever lived. He's in control. And he says to his spirit, you go on back to the Father. Says to his body, they'll come get you in a, in a few minutes. And his soul is headed on down to wait for that dying thief down there in paradise. I'm telling you from start to finish, this is, this is a death unlike any death that's ever been died on the face of the earth. This man is defeating death on his terms. Hallelujah. Look in your Bible in John chapter 19, point number six, John 19. John 19 and verse number 31. Jesus, there, uh, the Jews, therefore, because of the preparation, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now, that's religion. That's religion. The reason we, we trust Jesus, not religion, the reason we go house to house and tell people about Jesus, not religion, is uh, we agree with the world. Religion's a joke. These guys have just paid a man to betray a healer who went about doing good. They have just paid witnesses to lie about him. They have just conspired with ungodly, Jehovah-rejecting Gentiles to kill a man that's done nothing wrong. But they got to get his body down off that tree because tomorrow's a holiday. We sure don't want to violate our, our holy Sabbath day. So let me see if I got this right. You don't want to break the Sabbath, but you don't mind perjury, fraud, lying, murder. Really? That's religion. That's religion. You don't want anything, you don't want anything to do with religion. See, they, they were concerned. with As long as they had their outward show, they didn't care about the inward practical righteousness. I don't need religion. The world doesn't need religion. They need Jesus. Amen. All right, look at, so anyway, look at verse number uh, 32. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first. And the other which was crucified with him, when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Now let's think about this. On this side of Jesus is a career criminal. He has spent his lifetime in and out of first century prisons. 
Now, we have people in our church who were saved in, in prison, saved in jail. Hallelujah. Amen. We have people in our church that <laughs> haven't been to prison because they got saved before they ended up in prison Amen. or didn't get caught. Here's the fact. When these guys went to jail, they didn't go to an air-conditioned, heated place with running water, three good meals a day, a doctor, a weight room, a shower, indoor plumbing, and a chance to earn your degree while you're behind bars. Do you understand? They went to dirty, filthy, smelly, vermin-infested, diseased rats, bugs, worst food imaginable, just enough to barely keep you alive. And there, there's a guy who spent his life like that, hanging there on that cross. There's another guy over here. What kind of crowd do you think he ran with? He's a murderer. He's a lifelong thief. He's, he's been sentenced to die. You, you think he hung out with people that are eating three square miles, meals a day? You think he's living a nice house, living a good life? Let me ask you something. If those two guys are dead, and the man in the, are, are alive, and the man in the middle is dead. Doesn't that strike you as odd? You say, well, he was crucified. So were they. Say he was beaten, he was bleeding. So were they. Now, let me, let me give you something else to think about. The wages of sin is, and if you haven't found that out yet, wait till you hit 50. And then 60, it starts waking you up at night and saying, I've almost got you. And then at, at 70, it doesn't even let you get to sleep at night. And that, there's that passage in Proverbs about the drunkard. He wakes up in the morning and says, where did I get these bruises and these wounds? I don't even remember doing anything. That's, that's what life is like when you reach a certain age. You, you wake up and say, I haven't even had a drink. <laughs> Why does everything hurt? Because your body is slowly but surely, day by day, it is dying. Why? Sin. The motion, the Bible calls it the motions of sin which are in our members. Now I want you to think about something. That man hanging on that middle cross, he never sinned. So there's no decay in his body. There's no disease in his body. There's no corruption in his body. There's nothing in his body that has taken him one step closer to the grave, one step closer to death than the day he was born. Agreed? Amen. Now, you know what he did for a living till he was 30 years old? He was a carpenter. No hardware store, no power tools, no pickup truck. Come on, stay with me. So here is a man with a sinless body with no corruption and no decay in that body, who is chopping down trees, hauling wood, planing lumber, nailing boards in place. Do you know when those soldiers tore those clothes off of Jesus to whip his back? They had to, I, I know, I know the movie makers, they, they show Jesus, little scrawny guy, looks like he'd been on meth for 15 years and he, could, he couldn't stomp a cockroach if he worked up the, the nerve to try. I'm telling you, when they pulled those robes off Jesus Christ, I believe with all my heart, there's never been muscle like that. There have never been arms like that. There's never been a chest like that, arms like that, legs like that. Jesus would have made Schwarzenegger look like a punk. Come on, think about it. Now, that, that body, that man, he's dead? And those two jailbirds are alive? No way that guy on the right holds out longer than the man in the middle. There's no way that guy on the left is still hanging on and the one in the middle couldn't take it. I don't believe it. The strongest man that ever lived, physically, the strongest man that ever lived is hanging on that middle cross. The man most able to endure anything you lay on him, physically, is hanging on that middle cross. You know why he's dead? Because he chose to be. You know why he's dead? Because he said, it's time for me to die. 
I have, I have suffered for sins. I have satisfied my father's wrath. And now I will end this thing. And three days and three nights later, I'll rise from the dead. And whosoever will may come and be saved. It's the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, but that's no sinner body hanging on that cross. That's the God-man hanging there on that middle cross. Something to think about, isn't it? Come to Matthew 27. Let's finish up here. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27 and verse number 51. Matthew 27, well, let's read verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and the body of uh, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came up out of the graves after his resurrection, went to the holy city and appeared unto many. Finally, number seven, there's never been a man who died and entered the earth that had the earth shake and say, no, no, this is not appropriate. No, this man doesn't belong here. We protest, we object. The earth shook when Jesus died. The rocks rent when Jesus died. Some of you a little older than me, you remember when Elvis was the king. When the king fell off his throne, the earth might have shaken in, in just a little small area right there, but, but the, the rocks didn't rend the planet didn't shake. Some of you might be a little younger than me, and you remember when, when Michael Jackson was the king of pop, or the queen of pop, or the whatever, whatever he ended up being. When he died, the earth didn't shake. I was very, very young, but I remember when, when the shock, when John Kennedy was killed, and the shock when Robert Kennedy was killed, and the shock when Martin Luther King was killed, and, 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 and the shock when the, the uh, space shuttle blew up there on the launch pad. It was just right down the, the road from us. And, but there was no earthquake. There was no earthquake. There's never been a man lay down his life and die that had creation render a protest that had the very, the very uh, nature itself said, we are not participating in this. There's a man coming down here who doesn't belong here. He's righteous, he's holy. And when he died, and when he died, people started coming back to life. As soon as he died, the dead began to rise. There's never been anything like it. So let's go back. When Jesus is teaching beautiful things on the Sermon on the Mount, nobody raises a protest. When Jesus gives sight to the blind, cleanses the leper, causes the lame to walk, raises the dead, not a great deal of objection as long as he keeps it to the six days of the week. Every now and then he'd do something on the Sabbath and, and that caused a bit of a row, but they didn't start talking about killing him until they began to say, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. I am the door. And finally it came to a head in John chapter number eight and they said, art thou greater than our father Abraham? thinking that he would back down. That's such the idea of, of, of making such a claim. And he said, uh, before Abraham was, I am. And from that point on, all they wanted to do was kill him. What's the cause? John 5, 17, because he made himself the son of God. Because to call yourself the Son of God is, is to say, I, I, I'm God's equal. And that was the charge against him, the charge of death for blasphemy. He, he, he made himself the Son of God. So at the foot of that cross is a man. You talk about a bad job. 
There's a man there, he's a centurion. And the assignment that he's drawn is to keep wives and mothers and children who are watching their loved one suffer a long, slow, agonizing death to prevent the loved ones from coming to help. That's a bad job. It's a bad job. You know what that guy heard every single day that he went to work? Whining, complaining, cursing, bitterness. It's not my fault. I was framed. I got a raw deal. I don't deserve this. And that man on that middle cross, not only is he standing there upright, not only is he breathing normally, not only is his head not bowed and his body not, not hanging limply on, on the cross, he's not cussing. He's not complaining. He's not whining. He's not protesting. The Bible said in Isaiah 53, we read it last night, like a lamb before her shearers is dumb. Uh, look at him. He openeth not his mouth. And then he cries with that loud voice and how that must have shaken everyone on the scene. Nobody cries with a loud voice. And then, and then Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit and he's gone. And then they come and these two, these two guys, we got to break their legs because they're hanging in there. And this one's already dead. That centurion said, I, I, I know, what, I know what you, why you condemned him. He claimed he was the son of God. Look at verse 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. Praise the Lord. I've preached this, so I'm not criticizing your pastor if he's preached this. We've all, we've all preached it. But I, I, I want to say this, and then we're going we're to pray together. In the movies, poor, bruised, and beaten, skinny Jesus just keeps falling down and trying to get up and falling down and trying to get up. And it, it, we wonder if he's going to live long enough to get to Calvary. That's not what you have in the Bible. He's scared. He's afraid. Oh, no, no, no. He's trying to keep them from nailing his hands and they hold his arms down and they nail him to the cross. That's what those other two guys did, but not, not this man. Not this man. And yes, he was beaten. Yes, his face is torn to shreds. Yes, his brow has the crown of thorns driven into it. Yes, his back is plowed. We, we agree with all of that. He's not gasping for breath trying to stay alive. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's God Almighty, the creator of the heaven and the earth. And he is fully alive until the moment he decides he's not. And then he laid down his life as a voluntary sacrifice to pay for your sins and for mine. If the Jews killed him, you'd always wonder, did he even want to die? If the Romans killed him, you'd always say, well, well maybe he, he, he was trying to set up a kingdom and he failed. But if he laid down his life, then you have to know in your heart of hearts, he wanted to die for you. And he did that. And three days and three nights later, they rolled the stone away, not to let him out, but to see where he'd been before he left. Praise the Lord. So next time, next time you think about Jesus dying on the cross, I don't want you to rule out all the facts of the humanity of Christ as he suffered there at Calvary, but I don't want you to forget that's not just a man. That's God Almighty in a body of flesh, and death did not defeat him.